Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about talking with professionals to give the tools and the services that businesses need to be successful. And today we're going to have so much fun because I realized that out of almost 550, maybe even more than 550 programs, we have never talked about this particular type of technology for business. So holy cow, we're like breaking ground here. This is going to be so much fun. And so please join me in welcoming Jason Heavens to our program today. Welcome, Jason. Oh, thank you for the invite. Appreciate the, um, you know, the opportunity to you know, engage the listeners. Great. Well, let me tell people a little bit about you and then we'll jump into this. So Good. Jason is the sole founder and CPO of Epos Now. In 2011, Jason was a bar owner, frustrated by the lack of quality EPOS, which is an electronic point of sale, solutions available to small business owners like him. So he created his own and founded Epos Now with a commitment to delivering the same innovations big businesses have been profiting off of for years. Epos Now has grown to over 200 employees with 30,000 customers and over 30 million pounds in revenue with no external investment. Listen to that folks, no external investment and is now East Angelia's largest and fastest growing tech scale up as well as he has received frequent recognition in the tech track 100 fastest growing companies. So again, Jason, welcome. Thanks very much. Just, just for clarification, I'm not the CPO, I'm the CEO. Oh, CEO. CEO. Uh, yeah, haven't had enough well, coffee yet. This I wonder what CPO would aside from you know you're not that <laughs> droid. <laughs> to be fair, I've got a brilliant chief product officer. If I took, uh -huh. if we said that, he'd be wondering if I took his job. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. yeah. We don't want you. You. We need to keep him happy. So don't want to make him annoyed. No, absolutely. So, so tell us, I always, I always like to start with going back and saying, you know, how it is that you got into this because, you know, as, as I said, you were a frustrated bar owner. So tell us how it is that you really got into this and discovered that this was your passion. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when we talked earlier, we were talking about some of your listeners, you know, they might be interested in starting a business. So that mm -hmm. kind of story might resonate quite well, mm -hmm. uh, but potentially or, or I had a normal job just like anyone else. And, um, um, and I got really disenchanted thinking, you know, maybe I could start my own business. How hard would it be? Mm -hmm. But I guess everyone always feels that there's, there's these like barriers or it's really complicated to start your right. own business. And a lot of people, they never kind of realize how easy it will be. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a friend who, who had a clothing web, website and develop, um, developed uh, this website for mm -hmm. clothing. And, was, and he was an entrepreneur. And I thought, man, you know, how can this guy be an entrepreneur and start his own business? And he was telling me about it. I go, it doesn't seem that hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, I, so what I did was I thought I always had a passion for hospitality and I thought I wanted to build a little restaurant and bar and serve food. So I went back to my hometown and kind of opened this business up. And that's where, um, that's where I kind of thought, hang on a minute, I need, a, I, I, I need to get, you know, I need to get this business more professional. I need to run this. Mm -hmm. I thought, how do these bigger businesses do that? Right. And I walked up and down the street and I saw uh, they had this like computer on the, on the side, which is a point of sale system. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought, right, I need one of those. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sort of uh, looked on the internet, so I typed it in and I noticed there was no one kind of ad wording, you know, trying to promote this product on ad mm -hmm. words. And there was no one with transparent price. And I thought, well, you know, how can this be for someone like me that just wants to kind of purchase right. this product? Mm -hmm. Where's the obvious kind of place I can get it from? You know, mm -hmm. Amazon won't sell them, for example, blah, blah, blah. So I uh, phoned up a sole trader. They, um, who was selling the system, there was no kind of market leader. They came out and told me that it would be, you know, t tens of thousands for the system. So right. that's what I, and you're this thought. little bitty bar. Exactly. Couldn't, didn't, couldn't afford it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'd spent that much buying the bar and fitting it out. Right. So mm -hmm. I knew that there was more in the market. And from my sales background, I kind of thought, hang on a minute, this looks like an industry that's got heavy and professional services. So loads, loads of people are paying for insulation, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the pricing ain't transparent. Uh, it's just a touchscreen PC that costs like, you know, a few hundred bucks. 
you know, why can't I just get this stuff for free? And it was frustrating. I couldn't afford it. And I thought there must be people, right, like me, mm -hmm. that, um, that have these smaller businesses that, that can't access this technology, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so there was an underserved market. And that's kind of where the idea was born. It was born as a frustrated customer trying to create my own kind of platform, right? And that's, that's kind of the story. Mm -hmm. So do you have, I know you, you mentioned that, you know, hospitality is your passion and, you know, and, and, and you were a bar owner. How did you get the tech skills to be able to do this? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one, really, because um, cause the, the types of businesses that are built, and, and you, you mentioned earlier about being organically funded, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who are in a, maybe a set, and try, I'm trying to like resonate it back to your listeners so they can right. have some, gain mm -hmm. some value, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people perceive that they have to be like developers, right? Or technical. Right. Now, mm -hmm. does that help? Absolutely, it helps, mm -hmm. right? But when you get to a larger business, you realize that, you know, understanding the market that's more like product understanding mm -hmm. the market understanding you know how big the market mm -hmm. is and what price is that's a product mm -hmm. so product guys aren't necessarily developers and developers mm -hmm. they, you know they build the product using many technologies right mm -hmm. and sales people they kind of have a lot they have a lot in common with product people already yeah mm -hmm. because they right. kind of like understand the customer mm -hmm. they understand what you need they understand you know the price so actually you're quite well positioned as a product person or a manager mm -hmm. to actually to actually go in and start understanding the market. Mm -hmm. So when you're a salesperson though, you kind of understand profit and loss, you understand mm -hmm. sales, you understand all that. So my background, what I did first of all is I thought, right, I'm not a developer, I can't build the product, right? But my mm -hmm. idea might be crazy, yeah? Mm -hmm. So how do I prove the kind of concept before I sink all my money into it? Mm -hmm. So what I did first of all was, um, I bought, I thought, let, let's see if I can get something working here. So I bought an old U system off eBay, sort of kind of configured it, mm -hmm. got it kind of working. And I thought, right, I can get that kind of working. I've got the basic technical things. So what I did was I bought some software over the internet and I bought um, like a touchscreen PC you mm -hmm. have, like from PC World, you use Costco or whatever at mm -hmm. the time, set it all up, put the software on really cheaply. And then I made it work. And I go, right, this kind of works, spit mm -hmm. clunky. Um, software is not the best it's cheap off the internet but kind of like this is the kind of concept and I thought when I kind of put it together I thought well, there must be people like me that kind of want this mm -hmm. so we set up a basic website mm -hmm. and um, put the products kind of online with the software phoned up the software provider managed to get a really good deal so in, in, a, in a place where people are charging ten, tens of thousands of pounds of equipment I had my own sort of rough solution for only about mm -hmm. you know, 1500 bucks mm -hmm. and um, and I remember, right, so what I did then was I started to learn AdWords. So I learned AdWords, read the whole books back to front, mm -hmm. Googled everything, because I knew there was no one market in there. Mm -hmm. and, and at the time, right, it was under 5p. So I'm using pounds and dollars, so bear with me, the listeners. I'm sure you've got listeners all around the world. Uh -huh. I, you, can see, you can see that I've got a business in America, in England, in Australia, because I keep talking about Australia. I know, so we have to stop and think, what's that symbol? What's that? <laughs> I'm keeping US dollars for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So it was roughly about seven, uh, seven cents a click, right, mm -hmm. at the time zero competition for key terms of pos wow. and epos right zero. so that's that is a great yeah. opportunity for for a product that you might have let's say seven eight hundred dollars up front in margin right mm -hmm. to have that kind of bandwidth was phenomenal mm -hmm. so my idea was right let's say i charge fifteen hundred dollars the product you know if mm -hmm. i can buy the hardware at half that and i can acquire a customer for you know, 60, 70, 80 dollars. So I get all these clicks, I convert on the landing page. Mm -hmm. I've got a repeatable sales model, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we proved the concept. So I remember switching on the AdWord account and I sat there and then, um, and then to cut a long story short, obviously we've only got an hour together. Basically, you know, the customer started ringing in and saying there was massive demand cool. for the product. Yeah, so that's when we started scaling up. We bought some more applicable hardware. Mm -hmm. You know, the software was great for the kind of merchants we're selling into. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when we started scaling up the business. It was only until really that, um, it was only in, so I was happy in that, I was, I was happy, right? I was making money, I was really happy. Mm -hmm. I was my own boss, I had nothing to worry about, never really thought about doing software. Because mm -hmm. again, like the website like starting your own business, mm -hmm. we always think, right, that it's really hard to do software mm -hmm. and it's really hard to do things because you've never done them before. Right. And a lot, of your, a lot of your listeners are probably thinking like, you know, how do I ever build something? How do I do that? You know, mm -hmm. it starts with just trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought, so what happened was I'd sold so much of this software that I had this reseller agreement and the owner of the software like rang me up and said, look, I need to speak to you in London. So, okay. So I went to London. He turned around and he said, I hope he's not listening. Right? He, turned, <laughs> he turned around and said, 
he turned around and go, I think we've got a problem. I was like, well, I don't have a problem. I'm mm -hmm. happy. And he's like, well, you've signed up 454 customers. I said, well, in, in the last sort of seven or eight months. And I was like, well, seems good to that, me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that good? He goes, well, we've been going 20 years and we've signed up 500 customers. So yeah, <gasps> that's a problem, right? <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> They're thinking, oh dear. <laughs> Oh dear, right? So they said, actually, we're not going to sell you software anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're kind of doing is bad. Go away, right? So I've never we... seen it. So they told you, we don't want your business because you brought too much business. Yeah, you brought too much business and you're too much of a disruptor because that they believe that basically the whole market believed that you should sell it with heavy professional services. The whole mm -hmm. market was right. you know, thousands of dollars for an ePOS system. So all these dealers and all these uh, intermediaries, because it was a highly fragmented market, there was no square, you know, there was no, there was no, none of these players that exist right, today. Right, right. And it was, the, were, the big companies had it, you know, the, 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 the Walmarts, the big box dealers, they're the ones who had it, and, and the little guys had nothing. Yeah, so Micros used to own the market, yeah, mm -hmm. and they got bought by, um, you know, that was Opera, so they got bought by Oracle. So that, that's mm -hmm. what I mean, it was... And in the UK, it was like BT Expedite, right. you know, you know, Telecom, right? So all these bigger customers, they could mm -hmm. afford this technology. It was all mm -hmm. on-premise, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what happened was, so because it was all on-premise, it was all highly complicated. You needed all these dealers. What we did is we said, right, we'll set it up for you. We'll send it to you and we'll train you over the phone. Yeah. And you don't, you don't want to pay for... And then you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to pay for professional services mm -hmm. because you'll only get a one-time benefit. If you look at history, professional services, the first things to come. People give you technology so it's really easy to use. Mm -hmm. If you look back, right, you used to go, I remember a time, now I'm not massively an old guy, right, but I remember a time, yeah, where you used to buy a mobile phone mm -hmm. and you'd have to buy it for an independent shop and they'd have to tell you all about it, right? Oh, right. Or, mm, they yeah, set or, it up for you. They, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or do you remember a time when you used to buy a computer? You couldn't just whack it over the internet and sell right. start it up. There was you'd no to, plug and play. There was no plug and play. Mm -hmm. and, and think about this. If, if I got a new iPhone right now like this mm -hmm. and I decided to um, buy it, would I want to set it up myself? Absolutely. I wouldn't want right. someone in the shop to come up to mm -hmm. me, right? So we, we, we knew that was the way to go, but, but the industry didn't. So we traveled all around the UK at the time looking for, the, looking for these companies and saying, look, we sell a software. And they were like, look, what you're doing is wrong. You need to be stitching up all these people, loads of professional service. Mm -hmm. You need to charge them ten to $15,000 per system. If your method doesn't work. We're not going to sell you software, Jason, because you're wrong. It doesn't work. It's a bad customer experience. No one loves you. Go home. Yeah, right? I was like, okay. So realistically, we're back in Norwich thinking, maybe there's another way. You know, we've got no business here, right? We've got all these customers. Mm -hmm. We're supporting them. Um, but you can see that it's a really stressful scenario. Mm -hmm. This we've built up a big business with, mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue right at this point or, mm -hmm. you know, over, over the kind of period. And we're thinking, mm -hmm. right, what are we kind of do, right? So, so then we got into this. So then I thought, right, we've got no choice. We've got to like develop our own software mm -hmm. somehow, right. right? So I'm sitting there as a salesperson. I've got a team. Most of them are apprentices and young because we couldn't mm -hmm. afford to pay. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyone, anyone who was mature and inexperienced would have taken a look around the door and gone, no way. Yeah. <laughs> So we were kind of like, there was me and we were thinking with the guys, we we're thinking, right. And, and Dave was there who runs America. He was my first guy who joined. He now runs a whole American operation, right? Uh, so he's got like 70, 80 people brought into him now. It's nuts. But we were, yes, yeah, it's a great success story. And um, we were thinking like, what do we do? So we built our own software. So we tried to. So we, first of all, we got this consultant in. This consultants came in and they were like, right, what do you want to do? It's like, right, I want to, all of these companies that have been going for years, I want to build this myself. Right. And they were like, okay. And they were like, you've got no chance. And I was like, what? Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. They didn't. Mm -hmm. Why can't I? And they were like, because you ain't got the money. This is going to cost you millions and millions of pounds right. to catch up on all this, right? So I was like, okay, what do we do, right? So I found a CTO. I found a guy who was in London at the time, uh, who was working for London, who wanted to move to Norwich, a small town that I'm based in. And I said to him, I said, look, if you want to work here, I ain't got much money, um, but I can pay you a little bit. But when the software is released, I can pay you quite a lot. Would you like to come and help me do it? He was like, yeah, okay. So he helped me do it. And then the local university, we'd done a JV with them to help us with some development mm -hmm. tools. So the first day they sat there and we go, right, we're going to try and let's just try and see what happens. Right? Right. So we, this is the thing. And this is the thing for your listeners that has to resonate. You know, you just got, you just got to get it done. Right? I know right. it's hard. Right? Mm -hmm. You just got to jump in. If you think you've got a good idea, you've mm -hmm. got to limit your failures so they're cheap and easy, but you've got to, you've got to try. So I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? We ain't got a business, so why not roll the dice and give it a bash? 
you know, what's the worst that can happen? So we tried it. And I remember the first meeting with the dev. So we sat there and we had a little development team and I had the domain knowledge. So I was doing the product role, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they, so we sat around the table and everyone goes, right, Jason, what language do you want it in? I was like, well, you've got to put it in English, right, guys? Yeah, you've got to English. make it uh -huh. mm -hmm. And they were like, no, what development language do you want it in? What computer and I'm like, language? Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there going, well, we'll make it like the software we're buying in. Make it like the software we're buying in. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hang on a minute. Like, uh, well, it needs to work on your phone. It needs to work on the cloud, doesn't it, mm -hmm. right? So it needs to be everything by your mobile, mobile first approach, mm -hmm. because like, when I'm out and about, all I want to do is check stuff on my mobile, right? right? So that was a key turning point. Because we built software on the cloud, this mm -hmm. is going back nine years ago, it was wow. kind of, I know it. I know it seems bizarre now that you wouldn't build anything on the cloud, mm -hmm. but nine years ago, nine years ago, that was really, people were like, no clouds are just in the sky. How does that have to do with computers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and where we are in the UK, the small rural town, the internet wasn't good. I mean, we mm -hmm. talked about Australia, but the core, right? Mm -hmm. The internet, they're not very good either, right? At the moment. Yeah. They're getting better. But, mm -hmm. but where we, the internet wasn't even very good. Broadband was kind of just rolling out fully. Mm -hmm. So we're like, well, that's on your mobile. Let's build it like that. Mm -hmm. So then we were off to the races, really. We built a completely new platform. Mm -hmm. And the cloud technology, and, and when we went through it, go, right, this, we're on something here, guys, right? Mm -hmm. Because by building this on the cloud, right, we can have one version that everyone can share. Right. Um, we can have no technical debt. Everyone can have the best version. All mm -hmm. the professional services and setup that, you know, the Oracle and the Micros are doing now, that wouldn't exist because we can do it over the internet. If a customer's got a problem, right, we can swap out their hardware next day. Right. And we've and we don't have to charge them anything for, mm -hmm. for all the fresh services because mm -hmm. we can do everything from here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the kind of EPOS now was kind of born as you mm -hmm. see it now. And do you know what? That kind of, that kind of ethos of, you know, making our, giving our customers value all the time for what they pay for and really mm -hmm. promoting good customer service um, and built using the latest technology, mm -hmm. that enabled our business to scale. And what, we did, uh, what we did early on was we thought, right, how do we build a business on the cloud? Like, fair enough, our business. Right? So what we did early on was we built, we said, right, we haven't got a lot of money. So going back to your earlier question, the VC started knocking on the door at this point, right? right? And they came to me, but we didn't know about anything, right? We're too mm -hmm. bad to know, just two hours out of uh, London, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't know we'd build a billion dollar business out of nothing, right? So we were just sitting there and we just did stuff because it made sense. Mm -hmm. We hired guys and trained them up and got them selling over the phone. We distributed everything over the, the, the uh, DHL network because we didn't have, couldn't afford on-site engineers. We built everything on the cloud because it was the cheapest way of doing it. But when we fixed real-world problems, right, with technology, mm -hmm. so this, when we breathed it through our product, right? Mm -hmm. How we did that was simple. How we scout bootstrap the business was simple. We solved every problem we had internally with technology, right? So mm -hmm. let's say, for example, we're sitting in this townhouse, which is our first office, $200 and do a dollars, $200 a floor, right? And we had three floors, right? Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, we couldn't get a phone system. We went out to a phone system, like for a PBX system, it'll cost you $30,000. Oh. So what we, what we did was we bridged all the modems, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we bridged all the, uh, you know, the network and we built, built a voice over IP system so we didn't have to pay for any mm -hmm. infrastructure. What we did then was we didn't have any money for accountants, right? So we automated our billing system, right? And right. we automated our payroll because mm -hmm. we couldn't afford any accountants. We automated mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And then what we did was the first couple of years is we brought in, um, we brought in Salesforce. We had Zoho, but we changed to Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And we literally automated every process we had so we didn't have any wastage. And we right. used gamification, phone system, everything on one mothership. So the business was completely scalable. And because we had no professional service costs or anything like that, the business just was so cheap to run. We just, just and then the business exploded. Mm -hmm. It was nuts. So yeah, that was crazy, isn't it? I love <laughs> it. You know, and, and you know, many people, you know, when, when they first started, if they would have heard, well, you can't do this, they would have gone, okay. Yeah. You know, and, and, and just gone on to whatever. And, and, yeah. you know, and, and I think we see that happen a lot with people who start businesses. They hit yeah. those roadblocks and they, they think, you know, this is insurmountable, especially if it's someone that is an expert. If an expert is telling them, no, you can't do it this way, then you don't stop to think, well, just because you can't do it that way, why can't I do it that way? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's kind of like the, the um, you know, when, when we're working for corporations and they say, go do it this way. Well, why? Because it's the way we've always done it. Yeah. You know, and, and when you start thinking outside the box, of course, that causes all sorts of 
issues, you know, and, and, but it gives you so many opportunities to put stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the biggest thing you've got, I think the biggest thing is when you see people come from corporates in the business, there's, we need to have a, like a deconstruction phase as mm -hmm. well, because it's kind of like the world's a lot more malleable than what you think I find. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's right. a lot more. I think there's a lot more that falls in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And the problem is like, what I see in some people and not everyone, but what I do see is I see some people, they, they want to ensure that they've explored it. But when they get mm -hmm. a block, they want to kind of stop. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing is, um, you know, not, not to accept like a no. I mean, right. that's just not to accept a no, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that, make sure that, you know, the world's more malleable mm -hmm. than what you think. Change things, many, many layers to whether you can't do something mm -hmm. or not. And also if you're asking someone else whether or not you can do something, you know, they probably haven't got the answer. So I right. think you need to you know, believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. But I think most, most, if you look at most entrepreneurs, they just kind of try it. Mm -hmm. and, and the good thing is adversity as well. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. So the other thing is when you try stuff, you kind of need to pivot and change. Mm -hmm. Like those EPOS companies, so one, one thing your listeners might find useful as well, what we haven't talked about is when this disruption was coming on, right? Mm -hmm. There was all these other EPOS companies. Well, it wasn't ah. all these little people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were all over the world. So think mm -hmm. about Jack Dorsey Square or Lightspeed in the US, mm -hmm. or you've got many cloud-based POS companies mm -hmm. that are doing great business, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to be the market leader. But mm -hmm. what about all those other e POS companies that were all over the world? Yeah. They were arguably much better positioned, weren't they, to capitalize on the mm -hmm. change of cloud than, than, than the kind of this generation of POS companies. Mm -hmm. But why didn't they just do it? Right. right. That's what you're asking. Because mm -hmm. complacency mm -hmm. made them not move over to the cloud and come forward. So I think failing early, right? Mm -hmm. When people fail and they get a no and they have to swap and change and pivot, mm -hmm. I think that's really important for an entrepreneur to have that in his wheelhouse of having the resilience of like hitting dead ends. I think right. instead of hitting a dead end, rather than falling mm -hmm. off the wagon, having a nervous breakdown and going back to your old job, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think the best thing to do is see that as a, you know, a good thing. You know, you've mm -hmm. explored that, you've dealt with it, you've able to, that didn't work out well mm -hmm. because it's a business that hit you financially, that's mm -hmm. like, Bad, but it doesn't mean that it's you know the end. Mm -hmm. I think you pivot, change, pivot, change, pivot, mm -hmm. change. I think Amazon does a great job. Right. You see going into new industries all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's not easy to do, probably riding that wave, constant mm -hmm. disruption, pivoting. And I think that's what people, you know, you've got to be open to mm -hmm. new challenges and new ideas. Mm -hmm. Pivot, change, basically. Right. You know, and. I think a lot of people think, well, that costs a lot of money. Well, sometimes it does. I mean, you know, especially if you're having to change technologies or, or things like that. But, you know, Amazon is, of course, probably one of the best examples of that. Now, granted, they have an unlimited checkbook. You know, um, they could pretty much do what they wanted. But on the flip side, are the companies that competed against Amazon that thought and, and told people that will never work? You know, because obviously first thing, bookstores, you know, bookstores said nobody is going to want to buy a book online. They want no. to go in, they want to see it, they want to touch it, they want to read a, the first little bit of it. And, you know, clearly there are still real retail bookstores, but virtually none of them thought that's going to work. You know, and, and yeah. those that did came up with their own versions. Now, can they compete against Amazon? No. Um, but again, that is kind of, you know, Amazon has, has the unlimited resources. But the ones who said, this is the way it's always been, are the ones that, that are gone now. Absolutely. And, and that was what I was alluding to with the competition. Mm -hmm. Anyone, the problem is, what we see is when, when we built the business, we learned all that technology and the automation mm -hmm. scale of business, similar to what Amazon does. It's all automation, AI, mm -hmm. machine learning, all technology working to make them the best of breed. Now, we sell POS systems. Mm -hmm. And what we've been successful with is we, we understand that every business now needs to think like a technology business. Right. right? Whether or not you're a bar or you're a retailer, mm -hmm. Amazon is a genuine risk to you, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a retailer. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to start up now as a shop, right? And mm -hmm. one of our customers. Yeah, I say to myself, right, I'm going to start up. Um, I'm going to start up a corner shop. I'm going to sell exactly the same stuff as Amazon, but I haven't got the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, why am I successful? That's mm -hmm. obvious to see. What we see, though, is we see businesses become really successful, right, when they're selling products and services that they can't get anywhere else. Right. Like, for example, let's look at the shop, and I don't know how many vegans are vegetarians, so just pardon me if you are, but imagine if I started a local butcher shop in your area and I was selling locally sourced meats, rare breed all the stuff yeah that i can get locally sourced right. 
And those are the things that, that, that you, those are the businesses mm -hmm. that Amazon can't touch that you see right. doing really mm -hmm. well. The problem is in this market is you've got to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. If you, you can't compete with a pilot high and sell them cheap mentality, mm -hmm. you've got to be doing different things. You've mm -hmm. got to be doing experiences. Right. Those are the things that are going to take your business next level. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do then is use the technology like Amazon does to build great relationships with your customers, new products and services, you know, loyalty schemes. Mm -hmm. you know, think, about, think about the restaurant that's got a strategy to gain customer reviews and get them to feed back to mm -hmm. you. You can amend your menu based on what your customers right. want to see. Mm -hmm. It's that utilize of technology and that building a, a really long standing relationship with your customers that's going to enable a resurgence of businesses mm -hmm. to think differently. Now, what we see is we see shops thriving and restaurants thriving, but the right types of restaurants mm -hmm. that are creating that unique experience. Right. And the experiences that I had running my business, like deploying all this technology and all the uh, Salesforce and loyalty and all the re engagement technology you know, that we use. All of that is breathed through the product, right? Because mm -hmm. I believe that bricks and mortar should be thinking like a technology business too. Right. Otherwise, they will be disrupted. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, you've got to be running pretty fast right now mm -hmm. just to stand still, just mm -hmm. to be able to do the same thing. Otherwise, you will get disrupted. But right. some bricks and mortar customers you see, you see the pubs, right? Think about it right now. You walk into a pub and you see Budweiser, Bud Light, all of those beers along. They're selling the same beers is the bar down the road, right? So right. why would you go there or there? Mm -hmm. Whereas what's happening now, especially in America, you've probably seen it, and Australia, is the craft beer revolution. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen that, yeah? Yep. Oh yeah, my, well, because my husband is a huge craft beer fan. Mm -hmm. he's, he's all over it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so are a lot of people, because what mm -hmm. people want is they want something different. They right. want a community. Right. Yes, they want something local. I mean, that's his big thing. Right. He always asks, what is your best local beer? Exactly, what's your best local mm -hmm. beer? And so if you, if you were starting a uh, bar right now, would you mm -hmm. just, just allow sports and do the Bud Light stuff? Mm -hmm. Or would you, you know, would you have a passion for br brewing and create a unique product, right? right? And if you did that, even where you're based in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and you had the craft brewery outside, you did brewery tours, mm -hmm. and you invited them in, and you use them, you're offering a unique proposition, mm -hmm. basically. And then, you, and then you built on top of it, you know, loyalty and community, mm -hmm. you know, a relationship mm -hmm. with the customer when you release these products. I can tell you now that theoretical business we're thinking about right now would just absolutely smash it. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is you're, you're not seeing the end of business because Amazon has taken over. You're just seeing the, the, end of, the end of the same products mm -hmm. being commoditized in a centralized delivery point. Right. So if you just offer different stuff and use technology, you smash it. Right. No problem. Right. You know, and it is about giving that unique experience. Um, you know, yeah. we were in a craft brewery just a couple of days ago and it. Um, it was, it was a totally new one. We were in a different area that we'd never been to. And yeah. I noticed that there's shelves on the wall with the mugs from the place. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm thinking they're for sale. No, each one was now, you know, this, 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 this coffee mug, but you know, envision this as a beer mug. <laughs> it had etched etched mind you not sharpie not anything etched in glass or on the glass somebody's name and so they went in they bought the mug and they became part of the mug club and then there's signs around that are saying you're talking about the special events for mm -hmm. mug club members right, you know and that. and uh, I, who knows how popular that it was popular enough that they kept doing it um mm -hmm. but you know how cool was that you go in you get your own mug um you know all of these various things and but you kept going back i mean that that of course was the key we'll probably never go back it was you know a two-hour drive to get there and and so we didn't no, buy a I'm mug not. or anything but but yeah i mean you know that that made it a unique experience for the locals yep absolutely and those are the kind of experience. But what, what, what is that really? That's a loyalty scheme, mm -hmm. right? You're right. making it feel special for really engage with you. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant example mm -hmm. of someone being creative and offering something unique that mm -hmm. a big corporate can't offer. But mm -hmm. also, how do you lay technology on that to manage it for you so you mm -hmm. have bandwidth? Right. And, and that's where you see, um, that's where you see like, online forums and loyalty and email mm -hmm. marketing and things like that. They layer on top of it so they, mm -hmm. they can moderate the community and bring them right. in. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so so we see massive success in the bricks and mortar individually when they have something like that, like a really robust loyalty scheme, and they right. use technology to then promote it even further. It's right. brilliant, though. But for us, it's exciting. Yeah, for a consumer, how great it is it now, and how exciting it is to walk through those doors and have a totally unique experience. Mm -hmm. right. That that's the key, and mm -hmm. and that's what Amazon is driving. It's putting pressure on everyone to mm -hmm. think differently.
differently and create unique mm-hmm. experiences. Mm-hmm. So that, although it's a negative for some people, for the consumer, it, it's probably mm-hmm. quite unique. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, just look at Amazon Prime. You know, I, I don't know how many people have Amazon Prime. My mother had an Amazon Prime account and never ordered from them. She yeah. just, oh, need to do this. Um, you know, and, and of course, we watch videos and, and things like that. But I, it's for me, it pays for itself just in the, the shipping, you know, in, in like three or four orders. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm the person that has, you know, more than three or four orders. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, and so the key, the key, of course, is that scalability. You know, yeah. just the, the little place down the corner, you know, on the corner, the brick and mortar place can do that just as easily as the big Amazon. It, it does come back to technology. I mean, you know, they can't have their, you know, it used to be that they had like the card file. You found your card, you mark stuff. People don't want to do that anymore. You know, they want to walk in, they want to input their phone number or do whatever. And, you know, anymore, a lot of times it can read your phone when you yeah. come in. And so it knows that, that you're there. Um, and so, you know, you walk up and they greet you by name, you know, yeah, they, they knew my name, um, you know, and, and technology is just, it's, it's, it, it, it's come so far that that the nice thing is then it makes it easy for the small guys to be able to afford it. Absolutely. Totally agree. The thing is though, Amazon will always be in a position where it does all the stuff that's easily delivered to you. That's their mm-hmm. wheelhouse. So if you're competing right. with, you know, the, the toiletries, the shower mm-hmm. gels, the everything right. that's easy. You work mm-hmm. from home, probably. I'm judging that's your home, maybe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, this is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool, nice. So, so obviously, you're you're doing interviews like this. So mm-hmm. for you, it's really it's key. As long as they, they can come with you in the next day or two, you can get all your essentials. You have to leave the house. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Right? right. When it comes to those, when it comes to those individual items, but that's already on lockdown. Mm-hmm. So when when the sole traders have to think like that, they have to think differently. Mm-hmm. But they have to. But the same technology is available to them. That's mm-hmm. what happens with a good POS system, like right. plug, plug now. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's when you get a great EPOS system because it does all that. They do facial recognition. Mm-hmm. They can do they can do QR codes your mobile. Mm-hmm. There's even great technology now where you can pay by mobile and you don't even have to mm-hmm. face. Right. Most POS systems now already have Amazon Go. You see the Amazon mm-hmm. Go store. Yep. That technology is already available. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's so many different platforms that already give that already. Right. That's already available. There's no reason why mm-hmm. people can't. Mm-hmm. what's right. interesting is though right recently we acquired a business in australia so big shout out to the australian people Yay. in the business exactly right so I, I went in australia right and it's interestingly interesting to find because you mentioned earlier you've got australian listeners right mm-hmm. so we've got we've got a business in the uk uh physical presence in the us and in australia right mm-hmm. so i go to australia thinking right it's going to be like us uk yeah, yeah. same right mm-hmm. so you think same thing so you get there First thing you know, I was in a place called Sunshine Coast uh, near Malulaba, right? Anyway, we get there, and there is a uh, no Starbucks, right, at all. Oh no! Yeah. It's crazy for Americans can't understand it, right? No mm-hmm. Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Oh no! Where would you get coffee from? You have to go local. Mm-hmm. There's um, there was no. I never saw a McDonald's while I was there. I'm sure there is, but I never saw one. Right. Uh, and there's literally no chain restaurants across anywhere that I could find. Oh, outside see, I'd of- love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. So I'm walking down the Esplanade, they call it, right? Mm-hmm. And there are, say, 50 restaurants, all independents, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, so, 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 I, so I stop at this uh, chain, which they don't like. No one likes the chain. They go, don't go there. It's called Coffee Club, right? But right. they've got chefs. So chefs are in chains creating bespoke meals. So mm-hmm. I'm saying, like, guys, how come Starbucks never worked? And they're like, well, we like fresh food. We like uh, independent food. Mm-hmm. We like locally sourced. Mm-hmm. We don't like chain pubs. We like uh car scales and we like independent breweries mm-hmm. it's like nothing i've ever seen before right Ob- obviously so so i wanted to buy a table tennis table so i'm, I'm pretty proud of table tennis even though mike beat me in the office that's not good mike just shout out to him don't beat me next time but <laughs> he beat me. so what we did i'm very upset about this right i shouldn't have mentioned it on your show now everyone's gonna know Let, let's delete that bit later anyway right so i went out and i saw right let me buy a table tennis table so i'm thinking how long is it going to take Mm-hmm. So if I'm in Sky House and Chase Plaza in Orlando, it comes mm-hmm. in two hours, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, five days it would take to deliver from Amazon, right? So you end up driving out and picking it up. Right. Honestly, it's, it's, it's crazy, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the big chains, because of the population density and the distribution mm-hmm. chain, they've not been able to crack Australia. Right. So, and it's super healthy. Mm-hmm. Everyone gets up at like, um, in the morning, at like six at Sunshine mm-hmm. Coast, right? And I, I get there first day going, right, I'm here. 
let's go to a restaurant. It's 8 p.m. I'm like, brilliant. Everyone's stacking chairs. I'm like, what's happening? Right. Yeah, because they get up so early, they go to bed so early. What I'm saying is, mm -hmm. it's a brilliant lifestyle, mm -hmm. but it's 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 totally polar opposite mm -hmm. in the way people buy, the way people engage. People go for coffees and breakfast like before work, whereas in the U UK they run into work, they uh -huh. fill the day, and then they go to the pub at night and mm -hmm. sit there till midnight and get mm -hmm. up just before work. It's totally mm -hmm. different. And then the customers have different spending habits. It's a really mm -hmm. interesting market right now, mm -hmm. you know, to start a business because right. a lot of the stuff that exists here and there is done differently. So, mm -hmm. you know, approaching that market, you'll have to have a different, you know, approach. Right. Basically. Well, and, and this is totally a guess, but my guess is that, that they aren't huge fans of big fancy technology. You know, they, they still like the, the personal touch. So you probably have to do kind of that combination of how, you know, how you can give it the personal touch with still making it, you know, using the, the available technology. Yeah, it's interesting. So everything is, there's got a much, health, much healthier way of life, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more vitality bowls, uh, right. you know, pie bowls, I think you call them everywhere, mm -hmm. poke bowls, that kind of thing, right? It's a much more healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, the, the order flow is completely different. So in the US, obviously, uh, the service is spot on. You can't fault it because right. in the US, mm -hmm. the servers obviously generate most of their income from tips, right? Mm -hmm. So the order flow is you sit down, you have your meal, they then bring the bill, you put your card, they take the bill away, uh, they bring it back, you take your card, they put the tip on later, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Australia, right, you sit down to the same restaurant, so you sit mm -hmm. down, you order whatever, a beer or a coffee, you sit down, you have your meal, Oh no, sorry, you walk up, when you sit down, you look at the menu. When you pick what you want, you walk up to the counter. Right? Oh, okay, crazy. so there's no server. Not usually. And you mm -hmm. take one that like wooden spoon type thing and you mm -hmm. put it, you put it onto your table mm -hmm. and then and, they, and then you've already paid. So if you don't mm -hmm. like your meal, I mean, you know, it's gonna be hard to get your money. Right, back too here. bad, so sad. Mm -hmm. Bad, so sad. And then you just walk off at the end. No tip. Mm -hmm. ah. Totally weird. Mm -hmm. So it's a different, it's a different kind of culture. Mm -hmm. But but like you say. It's much more casual dining experience, you mm -hmm. know, than the kind of US. It's mm -hmm. much healthier. The level of, um, the reason why adoption hasn't been so high for technology is because, is because of the landmass, the internet mm -hmm. right. not being great. So even mm -hmm. when I was in a hotel, uh, the internet wasn't great, not like the US where it's fast mm -hmm. or the UK. They're a little bit behind on that. Mm -hmm. but, what, what that but, but it makes the Australians such a great market. I mean, Australians are really hardworking, really mm -hmm. intelligent, people you know just like you get in the us uk they're culturally very similar mm -hmm. you know but they've got a much more healthy uh, way of life so it's a really interesting um uh, thing to go out there and look at their culture and mm -hmm. experience it. i bet you know and and it's in many ways it's like we probably were maybe 10 years ago you know we we had technology it was okay um but you know, we, we, we still valued really those personal connections, those personal touches. And, um, you know, and, and we weren't up at, you know, midnight checking our phones. You know, what message did I get? Ooh, who posted on Facebook? You know, because Australia, we yeah. couldn't. They have everything though. So they're not, they're not like backwards whatsoever. Right, right. They just don't really use it. No, nah, yeah. Or they I, don't I, I, live by it. They're not attached yeah. to their cell phones, maybe as the, you know. Yeah, the thing is, Australia, where I went might be different, right? Mm -hmm. But it is such a beautiful place mm -hmm. that, um, that the weather's banging. It's living by a beach, right? right. So I, I yeah, you want to be outside. You don't want to be sitting inside at your computer. Spot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. But it's also interesting to see that market. Anyone looking to do business that market, you know, you know, they have to be mindful of that, you know, it's, it's difficult with the time difference. If anyone's thinking mm -hmm. about one of your listeners, you know, right. start, mm -hmm. start and expand into Australia, you know, it's very, very isolating as a mm -hmm. business owner because mm -hmm. obviously, especially from the UK, mm -hmm. you only get to speak to them in the morning and the evening. It's kind of right. difficult. Yeah, you're, it's way time difference there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, when, when I've had Australian guests on, I record as late in the day as I can. And of course, for them, it's morning the next day. And so that gets, you know, my, my brain kind of shorts out a little bit on that because they're, you know, and, and, but, but yeah, I mean, the time difference now, granted I'm in Atlanta, if I was in California, that'd be, you know, at least a three hour, you know, be a little bit better. But, um, but the cool thing is with technology, we can do that. We can Skype, we can, we can, you know, do whatever. And we're not having to really worry, but it was, you know, when we started, I asked, you know, what the heck time is it for you? Um, and it's you know, mid afternoon and it's morning for me. So yeah, technology does simplify a lot of this. 
absolutely technology is technology and that's one of the things when we started the business and that's for your listeners mm -hmm. if they're looking to you know start and scale a business mm -hmm. getting your technology stack right at the start is the kind of key mm -hmm. so the great thing is because we joined up all those systems that was mm -hmm. one of the key we talked about scaling early and how we've done mm -hmm. it organically removing that risk and getting that platform was the key mm -hmm. but when we went when we went and launched in australia because we had everything was on the cloud including the phone systems right. uh, and all the accountancy systems mm -hmm. we were able just to go right give the guys the login mm -hmm. and they go right um so it took us two weeks to onboard that business mm -hmm. and they were they were already trading so it's mm -hmm. two weeks right? right so you think about when i went to the us so the interesting thing is right when we started getting at scale in the uk there was we thought we we, we were kind of the only ones doing the cloud pos thing here and we mm -hmm. quickly became dominant player in the uk mm -hmm. We were signing up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers a month, right? So mm -hmm. we were live, right? Mm -hmm. But then we saw that in Silicon Valley, there was millions of dollars pumping into all these POS companies. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't our idea alone. They had the ideas too, right? So we were right. like, oh, God, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're only, a, you know, we're a cup, we're, a, we're people from Norwich. How are we going to compete with like, you know, your Jack Dorsey's or your mm -hmm. Silicon Valley investors mm -hmm. or your technology crossover ventures or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So I sat down with Dave. And I said, Dave, I said, look, man, we can have a problem here, right? If we stay in England and don't go anywhere, we're going to be starved out. They could take a view on the market. This was going back uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. So I said, I think what we've got to do is we've got to go to America, right? Because mm -hmm. that's the biggest market for what we do, mm -hmm. right? Because how will we do it? I said, we'll get on a plane, right? <laughs> and then we'll take it from there. So we got on a plane and we, we took a flight to San Francisco when we launched the US business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went around the town, stopped, you know, had a few meals, met a few people around. And we're like, right, uh, you know, we looked at an office. I remember looking at an office over the bay. I was like, well, how much is this a month? They were like, oh, it's $50,000 a month rent. I was like, Jesus. Yeah, yeah no, believe uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> We've got my little calculator out. Here it is, right? And I <laughs> typed it around. I was, saying, I was saying, Dave, I think, you know, we're unfunded. He was like, yeah, I, go, I think we'll probably need 20 million quid, right, if we launch mm -hmm. it because the cost can be astronomical. Mm -hmm. So we thought, hang on a minute. If we sell cloud software, this is another one for your listeners, right? Mm -hmm. We now live in a world where you don't have to be in the most expensive places. Right. So if you're running, if you're running a business and you're selling on the internet, mm -hmm. you know, any advice, we, we now got the democratization of these heavy, expensive mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. So my advice to any listeners out there would be manage your costs really tightly at the start mm -hmm. and why not pick an area which got the lowest cost base? So right. me looking, I was thinking, right, okay, where mm -hmm. should I go? I picked Orlando because mm -hmm. there was a, it was really low cost. Mm -hmm. It was a good level of uh, universities and talent. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it was closest time zone to the UK. So if mm -hmm. things if things had a problem, I quickly get over. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I remember going up. So I remember we went to Orlando, and the best building there is a Chase Plaza. It's a beautiful building. It mm -hmm. overlooks Lake Eola, which is in the middle of Orlando. And you can see the Disney fireworks at night. It's brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. And it's on the top. Oh, I looked around and go, God, this is lovely mm -hmm. and i remember they came around to me and goes yes uh, ten thousand dollars a month for the five thousand square foot i needed and mm -hmm. i was like that's perfect mm -hmm. so we um i ended up buying the whole floor of the chase We've got thirty thousand mm -hmm. square foot scaling the business out there but um that picking the right area and managing costs <laughs> right yeah that was well, really key especially if people aren't coming to you I mean, you know, if they're not coming to you, that's, you know, you, you could be in a barn for, for all that matters. Um, you know, I, I was a consultant with a company that they never had customers come to them, but they had an image that they want. And so they went in one of the most expensive buildings, paid the most per square foot, all of those various things. And I remember every time I'd be there, I'd look around and I'd think, why? Why spend this much? Now, you know, part of it was, you know, it was the whole glamour factor when they went to hire and, you know, all of those things. And, and, but at the same point, it was like, nah, you could accomplish just as much being 10 miles out. Um, you know, and, and obviously in Atlanta, there's a lot of, of space that you could go to, but yeah, you know, they, there's certainly nothing anymore that says, why do you even have to be in a city? You can be in a rural town and enjoy that lifestyle. Now, you know, you hire a bunch of young people and they probably don't want rural lifestyles. You know, they want to be where the action is. But, um, but yeah, you know, if you don't need to, if, if nobody's coming to see you, you don't need to be fancy schmancy. No, it's a good point, right? So when we look at our customers, so if you think about it now, right, let, let's say, for example, that those ideas of town centers, which you can walk to, mm -hmm. you can see it in America, right? In England, mm -hmm. everyone has a town center and you can right. walk to everything, right? Mm -hmm. So Norwich is like five miles there and everything mm -hmm. surrounds there's mm -hmm. nothing else there because that's how England was built. But you can mm -hmm. see the US is a newer country, right? Mm -hmm. So they have 
a mouse 20 miles away, a town uh-huh. centre, mm-hmm. and then they have another place 20 miles away right. because they can't do that actually everyone's got a car. But <laughs> mm-hmm. I think people like now, they're probably oh, yeah, nobody there. walks. Mm-hmm. No, no one walks anywhere. It's the first mm-hmm. thing you realise no one walks, right? But if you built a town city now, you can see that you'll probably be sporadic. Mm-hmm. Now, let's say, for example, you're in a new part of town mm-hmm. and you found you fancy some dinner, right? Mm-hmm. So you come to Norris see me and I wasn't there that night. You thought you were with your husband. You said, right, I want to go for some dinner. Would you A, go and walk down the main high street or would you get up TripAdvisor and find out or Google the best, highest restaurants rated, right? Trip You'd advisor. do that. Mm-hmm. Probably oh. TripAdvisor. Yep. But on. So actually now everything's changed. Whereas mm-hmm. before you would want to be the biggest restaurant in the best location mm-hmm. uh, overlooking such and such. Mm-hmm. And that would be great. Mm-hmm. Or in the right town, especially in the UK. Mm-hmm. Now it's more important to be a technology business as a restaurant. Mm-hmm. So it's more important for you to capture your great reviews. Yep. So you come and have a great meal, mm-hmm. you promote that customer, get them to mm-hmm. post on TripAdvisor or Yelp, whatever your mm-hmm. strategy is, because being number one or two is the most important oh, factor. Yeah. Yep. And that is bigger than any physical location. Mm-hmm. It's the same with me, right? My right. concept is to have the first ad position and the first organic position mm-hmm. in Google, right? Yep. So it doesn't matter where I am, mm-hmm. where I need to be, where is, you know, where is that best prime position mm-hmm. is first organic on Google mm-hmm. and one of the top three ad positions. Mm-hmm. So you've got to think, if you're going to plow money into position, it just matters where you're digitally seen. So right. that, that's, your, that's your San Francisco office overlooking the bay. That's mm-hmm. first position in Google. Because mm-hmm. if you're first position organically and there's enough search volume for your key mm-hmm. terms, that's what you want to be focused on. Right. And for a restaurant, it's that, it's that position in Google, in, mm-hmm. in, in Yelp that's going to get in there. It's how you use that technology and our system does this to, to actually build a relationship mm-hmm. with your customer, right. get them to post positive things for you, but also the negative. You want to be taking that negative right. information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, what went wrong? How can we fix it? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And how can we fix it? How can we change mm-hmm. our menu? What things they like, what things they don't, mm-hmm. what feedback the customers know, customers right. know about mm-hmm. your products and services. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a mechanism to feed that content back and distribute that, mm-hmm. you can make really good. You can dynamically create right. the business, you know, that mm-hmm. house your customer wants to live in, mm-hmm. let's say, right? Right. That, that's, that, that's what we see the use of technology is the best. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Right. It's such yeah. an exciting time. Yeah. You know, and, and for like a, a service-based business, it's definitely you have to be on the first page in Google. Um, you know, and, and because it, anymore, I might go to a second page, but very rarely. <laughs> You know, and, and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's what comes up on that very first page. So, so how have you optimized your website? You know, all of those various things and, you know, and, and, but yeah, the whole review process, you know, my business isn't now grant, I, I take that back and you'll be asked this at the end, yeah. you know, for a LinkedIn recommendation, yeah. um, you know, because people look at things like that. Definitely. So we, we do, we, and, and it's funny because we don't even necessarily read them. You know, I mentioned we were traveling over the weekend. And so I've got TripAdvisor open and it's like, okay, this one had 549 reviews. The next one had 20. Well, I'm going to go to the one that had 549 reviews. Now, 540 of those might've been negative. <laughs> you, know, you know, you don't really know. Now, I did look at the stars and, and things like that, but you, quantity is definitely in there. I mean, obviously we want quality, but, um, but yeah. And, and if there's a negative review, I want to see how they fixed it or did they ignore it? You know, and, and I'm telling my customers that all the time, you have to always respond to, to any of them, positive and negative, even if it's just to say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Um, mm-hmm. But if it is a negative, you absolutely positively must respond no matter what, you know, and, and, um, you know, and, and, and because you want to be able to say, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Absolutely. You know, here's what we're going to do to try and fix it. And, and more importantly, I tell them that the, re- the person who wrote that review probably never reads it. They never go back. They don't care. It's for the other people. When they yeah. read it, they go, oh, okay, well, that went wrong, but look what they did to fix it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And showing you're a balanced business that cares mm-hmm. and that you right. understand customer mm-hmm. satisfaction is key. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really matter what went wrong because mm-hmm. things go wrong and bad things do happen mm-hmm. everyone knows that right what you really want to show is that you're balanced and you're customer centric mm-hmm. we've all bought that product right where mm-hmm. you, know, you pick the wrong salesperson and you bought it and they don't want to know and you've had a bad experience mm-hmm. i think this key is if you're always willing to look after your customers and listen mm-hmm. 
you know, you're willing to treat everyone fairly. Mm -hmm. For us, though, at scale, business is easy for us right. because we don't want unhappy customers. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. we want happy customers because having unhappy customers is just too expensive for us. Right. Because it's just it's just not what we're about. Mm -hmm. um, but we've all had that negative customer mm -hmm. experience, and and we want to make sure that organisation is not. But to answer another one of your questions, like that 549 reviews over that 20, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know that kind of technology exists, that 500, I'd be looking at that going, how many of those are, what technology has that business got to stimulate a right. type of review? Mm -hmm. It's rare to have private reviews. Mm -hmm. you know, not everyone leaves a, a review off their mm -hmm. own back. Mm -hmm. That restaurant that you went to, they mm -hmm. clearly understand how to engage mm -hmm. their audience right. and how to drive traffic. Mm -hmm. And it's potential. Once you mm -hmm. understand the mechanism to drive mm -hmm. reviews, you understand where your customers are coming mm -hmm. from, do you understand the market, right? Mm -hmm. You can gain lots more. And mm -hmm. then they gain all your custom. That ironically, that one with 20 reviews might have better food, but they're not as good right. as the market. Right. Yeah, they so and, and some of it is just you have to ask for it. You know, if you yeah. see a thing that says, Hey, please give us a review on Yelp, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and and but you know, and and yeah, and if yeah, it and it's it is, it's that reminder, you know, it's it's you know, maybe it's on your bill, maybe it's you know on your receipt, all of those, you know, little signs How somewhere. Yeah, so, so how, how we you do it with digital receipts. You send them mm -hmm. a digital receipt, mm -hmm. and you, when, when the customer asks for a receipt, you ask for email address. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got the email address in the system, right. after they leave, you say, great, I hope you had a pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm. Please tell us how well we've done. Right. If they say you've done badly, then you get the review back, mm -hmm. and you deal with that. You call right. the customer, you deal with that, and it's mm -hmm. all stored in the CRM. Mm -hmm. If they've done really well with that, mm -hmm. then you push through an incentivization. Mm -hmm. Say, please, great, I'm glad you had a pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm. you know, to leave us a review, you know, right. come in next time, be great to see you. Mm -hmm. So that technology does exist. It's called a positive review funnel, mm -hmm. and every POS system has one. Right. One thing you did, Con, one thing you did, um, one thing you did touch on earlier, which is really, which I thought resonated me quite heavily, was when you were talking about content strategy. Mm -hmm. So you were talking earlier about, um, about how do we get a good position on Google and how mm -hmm. do we build a good ecosystem? Mm -hmm. One thing we haven't touched on for people out there is how do you get stuff in the domain, right? How right. do you build content, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked earlier about, great, give me a LinkedIn, I'll click it. That's mm -hmm. part of your strategy. Mm -hmm. I think because social media is so prevalent for all your listeners mm -hmm. out there, you know, posting ad hoc and things like that, and you sound like you've got a great strategy, but I think every user out there has to have a content strategy to build mm -hmm. themselves a the domain expert. Now, you, there's a protein company in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what they did, they were just selling protein, right? Just selling that out, right? And this is going to be brilliant. You listeners can think about this. We now use content to drive 50% of all our traffic, right? Mm -hmm. And I know customers that you, I know massive billion dollar companies, that's all they do, right? right. And this is the thing, right? So this is the thing right now that's going to enable you to get that good organic. Like we're number one for EPOS in the UK as the mm -hmm. type position. Right? And we worked on that. We built out the content strategy. Mm -hmm. So how they did it was they said, right, we, we're selling proteins. So we're just selling it out to people, blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? Customers were loving it. saying, buy our protein, buy our protein. Then they realized, actually, what goal are we trying to fulfill for end user, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So is the customer, they're either trying to lose weight, spend right. more time with the kids, mm -hmm. be healthy, or build mm -hmm. muscle. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they broke down those paths into these areas that were important and the why the customer bought. Mm -hmm. So what they did then was they thought, right, actually, let's help them with their goal. So buying the protein right. is a product, but right. what about if we deliver them? Workout plans, meal plans, recipes, all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. recipes, all mm -hmm. of this stuff is centered around that goal. Mm -hmm. Because if we help that customer achieve that goal, mm -hmm. their relationship with us will be much stronger and right. the content has as much value as a product. Mm -hmm. So they did it, right? Their business went from 50 million to a billion, right? Mm -hmm. Based on this. And then what they did was the final thing, this was five or six years ago, they built what was called the influencer program. And they said, mm -hmm. we're not the champion, the customer is. Right. How do we get our customers? and like me doing my link for you mm -hmm. how do we get those customers mm -hmm. like really promoting throughout their right. network mm -hmm. yeah, to build relevance in the domain mm -hmm. and that's where they got people that were key mm -hmm. in the areas as right. influence mm -hmm. yeah. even the even the guys listening today they can think about how they can develop their content mm -hmm. strategy you know you talk about the craft beer business how do they develop content around you know what beers are coming out why mm -hmm. are they important build that club mm -hmm. what beers are out when they're coming out what's the difference between high strength and build that knowledge right. base and help customers you know become more engaged with the brand mm -hmm. that's that's really really important now mm -hmm. as part of marketing strategy i feel mm -hmm. but people might forget but that's important right. i think 
You know, and then it is about those influencers because those people are then going to Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, and saying, I had a great experience working with X company, you know, and, and, and it, because if, if I see, well, I saw one today on Facebook because I've liked your Facebook page. I, you know, saw a sponsored post from you and it's like, okay, you know, of course they're going to be saying good things about their own stuff, but if somebody I've never even met were to say something good, it has a totally different level of influence. But if it's somebody I know, you know, if it's somebody I really know, then it's, it's very different. But if it's somebody who's like, okay, oh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, even if it's just, I recognize the name or whatever, that raises the level up. And, and so it's, it's, I, I love, you know, developing influencer. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a little, you know, landscaping company, you know, a little restaurant, you still have influencers. You know, the, we, we had a, a client who um, the mayor of the little town was obviously the influencer. And so when she posted on Facebook about the business, it was like, ah! <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Absolutely. Those key influencers in your domain knowledge, but also if you have an audience, if someone else has an audience, mm -hmm. that, that's really important to use that kind of to resonate. Right. So we, we have, we have people that we integrate the software with. So we'll mm -hmm. integrate with them, you know, a hundred different applications mm -hmm. that our customers use, say Zero Shopify, mm -hmm. you know, those customers on their audience, you know, those integrations are great because it gives customers a functionality they need mm -hmm. to be successful, but it also gives you a brand new audience and your audience mm -hmm. and those audience, right. you know, to amplify, you know, the message. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to this. I mean, you have an audience of listeners. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably have an audience of uh, customers, mm -hmm. you know, so it's about how those relationships then you know can amplify your content it's, it's right. a fascinating world we live in right now oh yeah and and of course technology is is what is driving it um you know and, and the one thing i mean we're almost at the top of the hour we didn't even talk about what you see coming in the future so um we'll definitely have to, to talk to you again about that because it is changing i mean you know especially with things like point of sale where the customer has you know they're placing the order you know and 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 all of these various things and then of course you toss in ai and um you know it's that's it, it's it's a cool time to to be doing what you do absolutely and all of the technology you just talked about there it already exists right like mm -hmm. we've been doing a pay by phone and self-ordering mm -hmm. for years a mm -hmm. lot of this technology although it's coming to the fruition now right. a lot of it's been out so we can mm -hmm. do ordering from qr code order from phone we can right. do ordering that we can do mm -hmm. kiosk we can do all that technology. Mm -hmm. It's dependent on whether the customer wants it, right? There's mm -hmm. a time and a place, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you stop at Wow As, you can probably order a sandwich and a coffee, right? No mm -hmm. problem, right? Right. But if you, if you go into a fine dining space, it's that white glove service that you really appreciate. Right, yeah. I'm, I don't want to order from my phone. Not always. And you know what? Imagine this. We're stopping. We're going to grab a pint of milk, let's say, at the shop. I'll go mm -hmm. in, grab the pint of milk, tap my card on the machine, run out. Do I want to download an app, swipe a QR code, pick the card, do my face, pay it, and walk out like I feel like I'm stealing it? Not yeah. everyone does. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we can't get ahead of right. the technology has to be the enabler mm -hmm. for great service. Right. So I think when you're in a place like Wawa's or something and there's a massive queue and you just want to order a sandwich, that's an enabler of service. Or if you want to have your coffee ready because you're in a dash right. and you want to get a Starbucks mm -hmm. and pick it off the side, that's the enabler. So mm -hmm. it's not about technology is displacing. It's about technology mm -hmm. making the experience unique right. and adding value right. to the process. Yeah, because yeah, there's also the people who want to have, you know, a quick little chat with the barista. And, yeah. you know, they, they still might pay with their phone or, you know, track their points on their phone, all those various things, or maybe not at all. They're going to hand somebody cash, you know, that's going to be, but, and, and I think that's where it gets tricky is realizing, okay, you, you, now, obviously it depends on the business, but you deal with hospitality and retail. So there's, there really is, you know, there are people who a hundred percent technology to, I don't want to mess with it at all. And, and you yeah. have to cover those or you're going to be losing customers. Absolutely. I think for us, mm -hmm. it's an educational piece. So like you say, right, I grew the business by deploying the best technology. So that's my, my DNA, mm -hmm. right? So I know how powerful. Remember, I built a business, you know, worth say $500 million with no investment, right? Mm -hmm. So right. I, I did that through technology. So how mm -hmm. do I breathe that technology mm -hmm. through the business of my customers, right? So mm -hmm. for me, it's an educational piece. It mm -hmm. might be simply like, making sure that the people that are on shift are the ones that are going to drive the most revenue for the customer. Mm -hmm. It might be just giving them real time profit and loss. So they make good decisions. It mm -hmm. might be just alerting them that they've got low stock items. Mm -hmm. It might start there. Right. But mm -hmm. ID 
you want the customer to have that competitive edge with all the technology the big boys have so they can survive and thrive and they can compete against the giants, right? Mm -hmm. That's the aim of the technology. Right. But the adoption of the technology, it should be easy and usable. Mm -hmm. You don't just start with day one and go, right, you're going to be using AI machine learning, right? Here's a manual. Right. Go and mm -hmm. right. It, it should be just the enabler, the customer. It should be so seamless. The, the implementation, the startup, train in 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and then the technology should learn about the customer's business, mm -hmm. provide them actionable insights. You know, it's more about, let's say, for example, me and you are running a shift together mm -hmm. and we're doing a bar. You do 200 transactions and I do 50, mm -hmm. yeah? Therefore, the system knows that if you're working, that then the business will be much more successful. Right. So the system should know that and dynamically create the rotors, mm -hmm. whether you're a shop, whether you're a bar, mm -hmm. based on what you do. Mm -hmm. And the system should automatically, in a retail scenario, dynamically select the exact amount of uh, products that you need in stock mm -hmm. based on your like burn rate. Right. Yeah. So therefore, you're not tying up cash mm -hmm. and you've just got products to sell. Right. And the system should give you really easy ways mm -hmm. to sell online. It's not about, it's about getting these companies to be as competitive and think like mm -hmm. technology business, yeah, without mm -hmm. the kind of uh, hurdles of complexity. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and that's what we do in a nutshell, really. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and you're dealing with the, the, the much smaller companies, um, you know, the, the one person or the, the, the one location restaurant, you know, the two location clothing store. We do, um, we do large, we, yeah, stop me there. We do. We, that's our bread and butter, but, but some but of our customers have guys. five or 600 branches. Yeah. Right. So we do see a range of customers. Mm -hmm. Like most, of, most of the ones we sign up as stadiums. Mm -hmm. So what, what we ah. see with technology, what we mm -hmm. see as technology adoption is mm -hmm. we see the bigger customers now going through that mm -hmm. because the bigger customers, it's like iPhone. Do you remember when the iPhone came out? Right. right? It was a consumer device. All the business mm -hmm. owners like, that's not a business device. I use Blackberry. Yeah. 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 Right? I'm going to use my Blackberry. Mm hmm. All of a sudden, though, the technology became proven mm -hmm. and it blew through the BlackBerry right. immediately. We're seeing that with cloud software right now. Mm -hmm. People, the problem is, right, what you see is big corporates, they don't change the technology stack like once every 20 years. Right. Like if you go past the stadium with Tills, it's not something you want to rip out every five minutes. Mm -mm. No, so that's thinking, expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they might have done it 10 years ago. So now mm -hmm. they're sitting there going, actually, maybe there's another way. And we're seeing in droves the bigger customers start to adopt this technology mm -hmm. because they're thinking, why should I let all these smaller companies have open APIs, mm -hmm. um, be able to integrate dynamically with my Salesforce and my NetSuite and all my Sage systems, right? And, and, and why, why should I let them have everything on the cloud so they can deploy mm -hmm. that and all this technology, you know, that we can import into other systems and see and all this AI technology, we're not getting any of that. So we're going to get displaced. Mm -hmm. So those guys now, they're going in droves to right. apply the technology. It's mm -hmm. just it's such an interesting time because those larger corporates, they've, they've usually been stolic and quite slow. And now mm -hmm. they're thinking, actually, you know, yeah. there is mm -hmm. a up or down. So those guys, we see them moving more into mm -hmm. this kind of space too now. Right. I love it. Well, oh my gosh, Jason, we are at the top of the hour. So tell people how they find your company and, and work with you. Yeah, brilliant. So if anyone out there wants to learn more, um, they go to www epos now so it's eposnow.com have a look at what we do and if you think you like it uh, drop us a line and get in touch and you can catch me on a uh, uh, linkedin if you want to if you want to chat to me perfect i love it you know this has been so much fun i i love talking technology um you know and, and like i said we didn't even talk about really what's coming in the future so we'll just have to to talk with you again be, of course, by the time we talk with you, the stuff will already be implemented and stuff will be even more in the future. That's what gets so confusing about all of this. Um, but I am Deb Creer. I've been having a wonderful time talking with Jason Heavens. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.